Hey, hey, hey. Hey, how's it going? Good. I'm so excited. Okay. This is like my highlight of the week now. I don't even know. It's crazy. Um, me too. And you know, people have been um, texting me and I got an email the other day too that was just like, I've been enjoying or, you know, you're uncorked with Carrie. Uh -huh. And uh, I mean, we have topics for years. <laughs> topics for years. I know there oh, goes my husband. Again. Yeah, I just waved your husband. He's probably like, <laughs> oh, I don't know what's going on. <laughs> um, yeah, I, I'm excited just because, hello, he waved me. Me that time. <laughs> um, just because you know you and I are both so passionate about apraxia and I just feel like maybe for me as a professional speaker having been like grounded if you will for a whole year now it's been an official I know. year uh oh I hear oh there you go okay. yeah it's because I'm sharing it to my page oh very so good I apologize no go ahead <laughs> Very good. Oh, good. We have Rebecca from Canada here. Hi, Rebecca. Thanks for joining us. But I just feel like it's so wonderful to be able to talk about it and to be with, uh, you know, my people. And I just, I don't know. I just, I, I love it. I've been doing a lot of podcasts. I don't pod, I don't have my own, but I've been a guest. I was a guest on a podcast this morning. And it's just so fun to be able to talk about this and to be able to reach more people because I feel like since I'm trapped here in Kansas City and never leave my house, <laughs> that I'm not sure I'm doing much good right now. So it's really, I don't know, it's very cathartic for me. And the fact that, uh, and we talked about this last week, didn't we, Laura, that we actually, like, this is fun for us. Like, we oh, This is entertainment this. for me. So it, it whether is. people would want to just come home, kick back with a drink and watch, you know, their favorite TV, TV series, <laughs> um, I definitely want to have mine with yours. Or yes. Mine with yes. you. I'm making you take a sip today. You oh, never oh. take a sip. So at least one sip. Okay. We're cheers. We're cheers. We're cheers. Cheers. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's because I'm so busy talking. So I have to show you my wine glass tonight. Yep, show us the new one. Okay, so this one says, and it's hard to see because I've already drank half the wine, wine aerobics and repeat. So can you kind of see it's got like the pull? <laughs> that's, it, 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 like, that's the only exercise I would do is like unscrew the cork. <laughs> so anyways, I'm having um, some lovely uh, Pinot tonight, I think is what I'm drinking right now. I have to tell you guys, I had like a really, while well, we're waiting for some people, we, oh, hi, Maureen. Hi, Denise. We have a few on. Um... I turned 50 this week, yes, so I had like a major <laughs> milestone birthday. It and is a major milestone birthday. And according to my son, I'm officially old. He has been informing <laughs> all of us that when you turn 50, you're old because you're halfway to 100, <laughs> and there's something about well, that. So I'm officially old, but um, <laughs> I, I don't feel any different now that I'm 50 than I did when I was 49, but um, exactly. you know. I'm good. I'm good. And I have to show you, I'm wearing one of my shirts tonight. So coffee, speed, yes. wine, repeat, right? So. I love it. I am actually, for those of you that don't know, it is Cerebral Palsy Awareness Day today. Yes. And so I'm actually wearing Advocate oh. Like a Mother Cerebral Palsy Awareness for tonight. I need to get, um, I love that. That is yeah. so awesome. Yeah. Well, no, no. I After I talked to you about what a nightmare making shirts was and yeah, <laughs> I decided yeah. it probably wasn't going to be up my alley anytime soon. Right, um, right. But no, I had a lady on Instagram and uh, she will make custom made t-shirts for really awesome. any disability. So um, I tagged her in my Instagram post if you guys want to follow her. But um, yeah, so for those of you that don't know, Ashen has a really rare form of CP called dystonic cerebral palsy. Even if you Google it, you're not going to come up with a lot. But um, I did want to represent so I love it. I love it. <laughs> that's, that's awesome. That's awesome. So for those of you, it looks like we have uh, about 57, 50 some people on here. If you were with us last week and I had, wasn't it last week when I talked about this infographic, the early yep. signs of apraxia, if you guys went to my website where I have free downloads, go to carrieebertseminars.com, scroll down, go to free downloads. I have updated the infographic. So even if you downloaded it last week, you definitely want to go back and re-download it because I had a ton of people messaging me saying, oh my gosh, those are the only signs of apraxia because I listed the right, and no, they're not from the research. Yeah. But so I added a, you know, a little blurb at the bottom that basically says, in addition to those that are in the research, we also clinically often see these other characteristics as well. So I did add that. So you definitely guys want to go and reprint that infographic. Tonight, Laura and I are going to be talking about apraxia strategies that parents can use at home and now that I'm an infographic like you um, are the infographic um, queen I, I'm so obsessed with them so I made one for tonight so you definitely want to go to my website and download tonight's as well 
Um, and I had mentioned to Laura, I've also had a couple DMs about this, that maybe next week we would do um, a Praxia Strategies for the SLP. Okay, so tonight yeah, no, we're going to talk about parent strategies. Obviously, SLPs are going to be using um, specific kinds of feedback and very specific types of dynamic cueing. So I thought, and I would love some feedback um, from you guys if you would be interested in, uh, in us doing that topic next week, strategies for the SLP. Because I had one parent actually ask me what those strategies would look like because she wants to make sure her daughter is getting, you know, therapy that is in line with um, principles of motor learning. So what do you think, Laura? Yeah, I mean, I just remember when we kept asking about topic ideas last week, everyone was like, just yes to everything, you guys. Like, <laughs> stop asking. <laughs> That's very true. So we're just going to decide, maybe. People I don't know. Just and you guys feel comfortable just shooting us, you know, like on the, in the messages here or shooting us a DM if there's like a topic where you're like, you know, Jordan from, what's Jordan's page? Um, fighting, fighting for my voice, my life with verbal apraxia. Yes, he was on here last week, and he had specifically yeah. asked that we post about the difference between motor performance and motor learning. So if you didn't check out my post, was it maybe yesterday? I kind of think it was yesterday's post. I did that specifically for Jordan. So if you're not familiar with the difference between the terms motor performance and motor learning, make sure you check that out. So that was um, specifically for our good friend Jordan because as an adult with – um, apraxia of speech. He is, I believe, back in speech therapy, isn't he? Yeah, he goes back and forth. I think currently he is, and it's still um, mm -hmm. telehealth. It's been kind of weird. Oh, sure, sure. So, so, anyways, okay, Laura, should we do this then? Should we? Yeah. Do you, have you want to share with anybody anything exciting happened to you this week? Well, I did. I was kind of in a rush getting here um, because we just, um, you know, got a contract for building a house. So I, we literally just did it like an hour ago. So um, wow. yeah, it's super exciting. And we needed to get it done because where I live right now, um, I don't, I didn't want Ashton to go to the schools that we're at right now, but we kind of got in this house. We were young and um, now she's going to middle school and it's just really important to me. I, I was able to choice her into the schools that I wanted in in the district because I was a school SLP for so long uh -huh. and um, which reminds me that was another person school SLPs have been asking me to give my perspective on the school SLP oh, and how it's different and um, so, <laughs> know, so that was another topic people um, called me about. I would sit quietly and just let you take over. I've never worked <laughs> in the school so that would still be a great topic. Yeah, yeah, I think it would too. And um, but anyways, um, I'm not working in the schools anymore because I'm full time private practice, and um, I can't. The, the schools we choiced her into declined, so we had to move. We had to move. Like it was not an option. Oh. So anyway, I mean, it was an option, but it wasn't an option for me. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So yeah, so birthday, new house being it's built. Like so it is a beautiful exciting. day. <laughs> it really is. It really is. Even amidst. Um, you know, the crazy times that we're living in. My daughter actually posted on my, for my 50th birthday a couple days ago, she said, um, you know, a, a happy second pandemic birthday, because this is literally oh. my second birthday in the middle of a pandemic. Um, March 23rd, we actually went on yeah, a walk you're right. here in Missouri on March 25th. Fifth, I believe I looked back at my calendar um, and so it's just been a, a crazy year and um, I don't know I, I feel like maybe we're starting to see the end of the tunnel I don't know, light at the end of the tunnel I don't know but um, I know I do too I, uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know, I was just talking to an SLP that I used to work with in Denver, and she's in a different public school system. She called me to ask about um, reading tests with kids who have apraxia and how to test them for reading, and saying she was enjoying our mm -hmm. um, episodes of Uncorked and was definitely watching them. Um, and we both, you know, said that though this is a crazy time and it does feel like the twilight zone, it, does. Um, it definitely is going to transform what we do professionally now because, you know, we, we would have never, we, I, I don't think it's possible of course anything's mm -hmm. possible but I don't think we would have conceptualized uncorked and you know been able to do this mm -hmm. because you would have been traveling all the time right. and um, you know I wouldn't have even as been into big as telehealth as I was and you right. know so this really is post COVID if there right. ever I mean, there's gonna be a post COVID sure. I, I do feel like this is gonna transform um, the way we can disseminate information and yeah. um, it just opens up more doors so, so I'm just it thrilled does. to it be does. doing this you know I I and I hate to do this like when I like put you on the spot, we're live, but I've had several requests to put together a 
training, like an hour long training on apraxia specifically for parents. And so mm. I wonder if maybe that would be something we should do. Yeah. You know what I mean? I don't even know how we would do it because it would probably have to be recorded. I don't know. I'm just trying to think, uh, you know, out loud here, but, um, all of my trainings, you know, are for professionals and I keep yeah. getting people asking, um, I've had two parents today email me and say, if I wanted to take one of your courses as a parent, which one would you recommend? And I'm mm. like, the problem is my courses are designed for SLPs who already have knowledge, you know, of, yeah. um, you know, speech therapy and the anatomy and physiology, all that. So I'm like, gosh, I really, I, I mean, you might get some things, but it's kind of like, pfft. so I think that, um, and if there are parents on, you know, it would be helpful just to know, have you ever taken a course? Has anybody ever geared, uh, like an online training, um, specific for parents, um, you know, on what apraxia is, what principles of motor learning are, how, you know, I hear parents say something like, um, oh, I thought he had apraxia, but my speech therapist said he has a phonological something or other, you know, and so I just think we need to give parents the lingo, you know, and give them some of those terms. So um, I would love That's it. a fabulous yeah. idea. Before we get um, into our topic, Laura, someone, Julie has a question about ICD-10 codes for suspecting apraxia. Um, I, do you, do you do insurance billing? Do you have? Yeah. So, I mean, if it's a suspected apraxia scenario, I'm still billing at um, F80.1, which is just a expressive language delay. Um, uh, the other thing you could do is do like an R47.89, I think it is, which is other speech disturbance. And that way you're documenting that you hear something that doesn't seem developmentally typical, mm -hmm. um, you know, without an R indicates, the R codes indicate um, neurological. Neurological, so, right. Yeah. R R48.2 is the code for childhood apraxia yeah. of speech. Um, if the child is verbal enough, uh, you can't use that code if the child is pre-verbal. Do you know what yeah, I mean? If the child doesn't talk, you can't say, oh, but he doesn't have a consonant by 12 months, yeah. therefore he has apraxia. So, but once the child is verbal enough and I feel confident, even though I may not be confident giving the full-blown um, diagnosis, I will use R48.2, but state in my report that this is suspected CAS, that I am using principles of motor learning um, and treating it as though it is apraxia. And one thing Dave Hammer um, and I put in our apraxia book is that when using suspected CAS, it's recommended that you document that at least six months of individual speech therapy is recommended before a definitive diagnosis can be made. But mm. the point is we're still using all of our apraxia, um, you know, strategies, and we're using principles of motor learning. And so uh, I think it's really up to, uh, you know, providers, you want to make sure you're doing things that are ethical, but R48.2, right. I don't have a problem using it if the child is verbal, that I do have, <laughs> you know, some pretty good data that shows that this is likely more than a late talker, right? That it's, yeah. It's, and if you, you know, if you, I do think that, you know, you and I have extensive experience. So a lot of times during a first visit, it's likely we're going to be able to um, tease that out if they are verbal. Mm -hmm. If they are verbal and a therapist is out there and you don't feel totally comfortable yet, I mean, I think it's valid to just operate under the suspected diagnosis, but do diagnostic therapy is what we call yes. it, mm -hmm. and continue to look and document for characteristics of apraxia and document when you see them. And, right. um, you right. know, across time, you might get a better uh you know, you have better picture. So yeah, Julie just said, I use R48.2. I was just wondering why there's no umbrella term for motor speech disorder. And there isn't because there's dysarthria and there's dysarthria non-CBA. There's, there's dysarthria post-CBA. I mean, you know, and we don't need to get into coding here because we're going to bore parents <laughs> to death. Um, but, and I'm right. certainly not a coding expert, but uh, we just should be grateful we actually have a CAS code because before um, the DSM, uh, or I mean, before uh, these new codes, the ICD-10 code, came out we didn't really have it was only CAS or I mean it was only apraxia for adults you know post stroke so I'm very grateful that we have an actual code now and you know I'm part of a group of SLPs in the metro area that just kind of help each other stay abreast of this stuff and Asha is pretty responsive so you sure. know if you do want to um, email Asha I do find them to be actually pretty responsive and um, give you some good advice so yeah, and I love that. And for me, as an SLP living and working in Kansas City, Missouri, um, <laughs> I always thought of ASHA as being like this entity that was like bigger than life. I don't know. You know, it's just this. And yeah, so right. I have presented at the ASHA building three times now. I, there's a group <laughs> out there in Washington, D.C. that brings me out. And they actually, ASHA, so I've been to the ASHA building. It's beautiful, but it's not like 
mega, like, you know, I, I mean, it's, they're, they're normal people. They're, you know, there's regular people. Yeah, that exactly. there. It's just a building and you walk in and <laughs> it's just, you know, so ASHA isn't <clears throat> to be scared of. They are there to work for us as SLPs. And I agree. <laughs> they are, um, I've talked to multiple people there um, that I would have always thought, oh, I'm not like, anybody in the speech world that Asha would want to talk to me. And it's just, what? So, oh, yeah. no one would oh, believe no, that no, anyways, no. Carrie. <laughs> oh, okay. Okay. Can we talk about apraxia strategies? All right. All right. We'll get on topic here. That parents can use at home. I just have to look here now and see in Ontario, um, Canada, we can't diagnose, of course. So I we know. Have I've heard that too about Canada. Of, and yeah, I know Canada and, you know, I've had several uh, agencies from Canada ask me to come present there and then the issue must always be getting me there because it's never panned out. I've never presented in Canada. And so I think that one of the things we have to do, especially like when I present is say in the United States, X, Y, yeah. and Z happens. Do you know what I mean? Uh, and yeah. so it's not the same in the UK. It's not the same <clears throat> in Canada. And um, the thing that I think, and I just saw, I believe it was. Edie Strand, I, I'm trying to think now, I just saw some, I can't, I shouldn't say that now because I can't remember, but it was something <laughs> on social media that I saw and it was like a quote from, I'm sure it was, was Edie, but um, that said, uh, childhood apraxia of speech is not a medical diagnosis. It is a, a speech disorder diagnosis. And so everybody wants to make- I saw that too. Yeah, who, who was that? that? I don't know. I don't know. I was like, yes. Everybody yeah. freaks out and Canada freaks out and says, no, a doctor has to diagnose it. And here's my concern is how does a doctor know how to differentially diagnose CAS from dysarthria, CAS from a phonological impairment, CAS from an articulation disorder? If, if somebody other than an SLP is going to diagnose CAS, I want to see how they came up with a differential diagnosis. I want to see what tests they administered. I want to see, you know, how they ruled out everything else. And I'm telling you, there is not a doctor on the planet who can do that. That is the speech language pathologist, uh, uh, a job, you know, and responsibility to do that. So that's why I get concerned that Canada says a doctor has to diagnose. That'd be like saying, Carrie, you're an SLP, but I need you to diagnose, um, you know, uh, high blood pressure. Oh, okay. Well, I don't know. I mean, I can, you know, I mean, I can't diagnose stuff outside my scope of practice. I mean, this just reminds me of my story. I'll tell it very quickly. When I went to neurology, and the only thing I was looking for in neurology was just a referral for the MRI and, you know, things like that to see if something was going on with Ashlyn. And um, she was resolving at the time. So had you talked to her, um, she's pretty intelligible, um, just like she is today. And the there was a resident um, person who was primarily dealing with us. And then there was, of course, their supervisor. And um, the resident was talking to the supervisor and saying that, you know, mom said that she has apraxia. And uh, the supervisor um, went to look, talk to Ashlyn and talking to Ashlyn, she was talking pretty good. Mm -hmm. And um, so in front of me, I have my two year old son behind me who's being crazy. And I, I don't look like a professional. I look like a burned out mom, <laughs> you know, in my yoga pants and God knows what I've thrown on for the day. And so behind, like, I'm trying to like rein in my son, but I, I'm, I am listening to her talk to her resident. And she says, um, Oh, okay. Well, hold on. So she goes over to Ashlyn. She talks to her briefly, goes back to the resident and was like, yes, this girl doesn't have apraxia. And I'm like, whoa, 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 wait. And I was like, I'm sorry, what did you say? And she was like, oh no, we, that's negative for apraxia. And I was like, no, she has apraxia. And I was like, would you like me to take you through a motor speech exam? I can show you where we can find, where you can see it. She's resolving now, but she has it. And uh, she literally doesn't look at me. It's like she had like blinders on, stares at her resident and is like, oh, was this the SLP mom? <gasps> yeah. And like literally Carrie, she still didn't put it in the report. Still didn't put it in the report. And I was like, I could have, I could have shown her like legit. I could have taught this girl. I could have taken her to school for a minute <laughs> like let me oh. show you if you want to feel confident about saying someone doesn't have a praxia let me show you how to do a quick motor speech exam on a girl that's this verbal and this intelligible because you can you right. can can i just say laura this is why we drink. I mean, not, <laughs> I know, I mean exactly. seriously, like people wonder why, why SLPs and specifically SLP moms, why we have to drink so much. And I'm like, <laughs> trying to get medical professionals yeah. to listen to us. Can I tell you something totally off topic, you guys? And I promise then we're going to get to our, to our discussion, okay? <laughs> yes, of course. But you just got to give us, like, you're, you're, this is the only interaction I have with non-family <laughs> members ever week. So I'm really, I just love this. So Bring my it, mother, girl. 
is elderly. I was a whoop, so I just turned 50. And my I mom, was a whoops, too. That's so fun. I, I, I was. I love it. I love it. Um, my mom um, is 89, okay? so um, oh, and, and she is uh, adorable. She is adorable. And when she was, let's see, so five years ago, five or six years ago, mm -hmm. she got really sick, and she got pneumonia. So she's in the hospital. It's pre-COVID, so I'm there with her, obviously. And I'm watching her take her pills, and she has clear signs of aspiration, right? She's taking her medicine and coughing and sputtering. Her nose is running. And oh, so no. I said to the nurse, I'm <clears throat> is aspiration pneumonia. And she kind of looked at me like I'd lost my mind. I said, well, I am a speech language pathologist. And, you know, so I was trying to clarify because she looked at me like, oh, somebody who's been on Google, you know, uh, uh, trying to figure this out. I said, no, 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 I really would like to do a, a swallow study, you know, a modified barium swallow study and see if uh, she has, um, if she's aspirating. She was rolling her eyes and being totally dismissive of me. The doctor comes in for rounds the next morning at 5 a.m. I actually show up at the hospital at 5 a.m. so that I can be there to talk to him. And he also rolled his eyes at me. But he did say, since you're an SLP, if it'll make you happy, that's what he did. If it'll make you happy, we'll schedule a modified barium swallow study. So that afternoon, it got scheduled. The SLP oh my the gosh. actually came into the room and invited me to go to the swallow study, professional courtesy. So I got to go. My mom aspirated every okay. Yeah, good. Made her NPO and everything. So she had aspiration pneumonia. They weren't even going to test for it. They just kept pumping her full of antibiotics, IV antibiotics. She wasn't getting better. She'd been there five days, wasn't improving. She was eating by mouth, drinking by mouth, throwing her head back, right? And it took me. Oh, my now heavens. Think of all the people, the elderly people who don't have a speech language pathologist for a daughter, right? Or a daughter-in-law or whatever. Right. And it's just so frustrating. Very concerning. Right? Yeah, when you're a professional and you still can't get medical professionals to listen to you because they think you're trying to be nosy and do you, their job. I don't know. So I feel for you, Laura, the fact that that doctor said negative for apraxia. Like, you don't, how dare you even say that after talking to my daughter for, what, five minutes, ten minutes? <laughs> five minutes, literally five minutes. And, in fact, I was so incensed after that, I created my own meme that was essentially like, stay in your lane. <laughs> this ain't your lane. <laughs> I'll you have to repost it after my, that. <laughs> you're my soul sister. I love this so much. I can't even. I can't even. Okay. Okay, guys. So we have okay. 101 people on. So I haven't been able to keep up with all the comments, but um, yeah, it looks like some of you are agreeing that, yeah, we need to advocate, right? Absolutely. So, okay. So apraxia strategies that parents can use at home. And really, these strategies, a lot of them are for kind of those minimally verbal kiddos. I think Laura would agree some of these are appropriate, though, for kiddos who are, yeah. you know. Oh, yeah. Oh, they verbal. definitely are. Yeah. So um, Laura and I kind of came up with this. And um, I, again, it's free on my website under, under, what do I call it, free downloads or free handouts, something like that. So it is an infographic. So when you print it, it's kind of small. I also would love feedback on, do you like the infographics or would you prefer I just make it like a regular handout so that when you print it, it's not so small? I don't know. I'm just trying to figure this whole, you know, um, creating handouts thing out. So anyways, let's start with our strategies. Two, four, six, eight, ten. Do we have time to do ten of these, Laura? We got this. We got this, Carrie. Let's go. Okay. Okay. You start with You're the first one, Laura. Do you have it pulled up? Yeah, I have it pulled up. So um, one thing, and I actually learned this from early interventionists, because to give you a little bit of my background, I worked in the schools. And so I might have had, you know, like a preschool population, but essentially I was always dealing with three and up and primarily five and up. So, um, you know, when you're five and up and they've already had school experience and been exposed to routines and different things like that, um, sure. it's not so much a trick to get them to um, do stuff <laughs> as right. it is with your little biddies who mm -hmm. are in their deck declaration of independence stage and if they don't yeah. want to talk to you they're not going to. Mm -hmm. um, so I actually co-treated with a early interventionist who came to me and um, she offered choices and it was so smart because it was so tricky and the child didn't realize that it was still kind of a direct <laughs> form of speech therapist. So you know I'd be like you know trying to be like oh is this purple? Purple! And the early interventionist was like is this pink? 
or is this purple? And then the kid's like, oh, purple. <laughs> I was like, oh, the power of verbal choices right there. Right, um, right. And, and they don't have to feel, some kids will obviously still feel like that is an on-demand um, type activity, but I did find that offering verbal choices whenever I can, you know, do you want the apple or do you want the banana? Do you want the cow? Moo. Or do you want ba? Um, it, it did lend itself more more for them to maybe imitate after me. And right, um, right. yeah, I just, I actually learned that from an early interventionist. What happens if you ask a lot of yes, no questions? So that's one of the strategies I coach parents on is ask, um, you know, give choices instead of yes, no questions. So do you want an apple? Right, 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 right. Yeah, exactly. right? Like, do you want apple? Apple. Do you want apple? Yeah, you know, exactly. like, like, do you want apple or you know yogurt or whatever yes. it is? Even though they still may not answer at least they're now they can't just nod their head right they can't exactly do, uh, so it does and then what we can do i remember i had a little guy yogurt was his favorite food in the world and there was no <laughs> way he was going to motor plan to say yogurt yeah it's a hard one out. so he would call there yogurt you go. No. the problem yeah. is yogurt is a two-syllable word so yeah. i used that reduplication phonological process, and we taught him yo-yo. So yo-yo yeah. was yogurt, and that was our approximation very early on for this two-year-old so that he could do apple or yo-yo. Yeah. Yo, yo. So we yeah. were getting approximation. So now when we talk next week about strategies for the SLP, that's one of the strategies as an early intervention provider that I use is I do teach speech simplifications because kids with apraxia don't, they don't seem to be born knowing how to simplify words. So we actually teach them those, those um, uh, expected phonological processes. But we'll talk about that next week. So offering verbal choices. Parents, is that good? Are you good with that? Instead of asking yes, no, you're just simply going to ask um, choices, right? Offer two choices, right? Do you want blank? And in that way, I will tell you another thing that that allows the child with motor planning to do is motor planning also involves a difficulty with initiation. Mm -hmm. So initiation is a motor planning um, issue. And a lot of times if they have dyspraxia along with their apraxia, that motor initiation piece is hard. So let's say you offered two choices and they didn't say the word, but they went and grabbed the hand that you said whatever was for. You're holding mm -hmm. the milk or you're holding the water, you're holding the cow or you're holding the sheep, they are still being taught motor initiation, right. which I still will need when we start working yes. on that verbal speech. I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. Because last week I asked you guys, what does praxis mean? Praxis means movement. When you look at the components of praxis, the first component of praxis is initiation. And yeah. so that is one of the issues is we see kids who struggle initiating, right? So they, yeah. they look engaged, their joint attention is good. They're smiling at you and they don't move a muscle. And you're like, yeah. oh my gosh, she doesn't even initiate a gesture. So that is why initiating a gesture. Yes. So have you ever, Laura, worked with a child where you're like, um, I don't know, do you want, you know, wine or water? So now for two, that's all I have in front of me. So you have choices. And have you ever had a child who reaches for both? He's like, bonk, right? Yeah, so for sure. Who does not yet know how to make a choice when offered yes. to wine. That is a pre-linguistic skill. So that, yes. you know, that's something then we want to write a goal. Child will make a choice when offered two items. So let's say I know Laura definitely wants the wine. So what's the strategy? <laughs> you want wine there or you water. Go. <laughs> I put the wine closer because I know yeah. you're going to grab the one closer. So that's again, beautiful. those are strategies that SLPs know to use, but I'm not sure parents are intrinsically knowledgeable about those strategies. So that's why um, offering verbal choices is first. And I see some, I, I love this. This is great. Yeah. And I just want to add and say that, you know, parents, you can do so much without having to focus on the specifics of speech, because I will tell you primarily, I think I've talked about this before. If a parent calls my office and they're under three, I am usually going to say no, mm -hmm. <laughs> unless I have a parent who's really like, no, no, I got to get right, it right. because the early interventionists set the stage for being able to do the hard work of therapy that I'm going to be requiring of the child. Right. And, and I can do all of these too, but if you can get it with your early interventionist for yes. free, yes. get it for free Absolutely. because I'm going to need all of these skills before yes. I jump in. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I remember when I was, you, Nancy Kaufman, you know, Nancy Kaufman, right? Of course. So I remember, I mean, I met her years, and years ago. 
when she spoke in Kansas City. And she was like, oh, Carrie. So I was talking. She's like, you know, what population do you work with? I'm like, birth to three. She's like, oh, you're the one who gets them ready to come see me. And I'm oh, like, I absolutely. Because, she's 100% right. She's right, though, because early intervention, you can't expect toddlers to do speech therapy the way a three, four, five, six, seven-year-old does therapy. And so when parents say, oh, I just want you to teach him to talk. And I'm like, well, no, no, no. I'm here to empower you to provide you with strategies so that together we do this as a team together we can support your child's uh, development of these necessary skills so when your child does turn three guess what they can do traditional type you know speech therapy where it's you know uh, adult directed and we're really focusing on repetitive speech practice and all of those things so second exactly. strategy, okay and i'll yep, talk take about it this away. if you're cool with this is yep, take it away when we're working with minimally verbal kiddos we really want to focus on what i call powerful words and what i mean by that is things like letters numbers shapes and colors aren't very powerful to communicate okay <laughs> they are very helpful to um answer questions if you're quizzing your child what color is it how many are there what shape is it but in the grand scheme of things communication I'm not talking speech or language I'm talking the umbrella yeah. of communication right now has to be about reciprocity and that's a really exactly. fancy, fancy word for, for I, I do you do I yes. do you do I do you do I'm talking to you now parents okay? <laughs> this is why as an early intervention provider one of the first skills that I will work on with a young child in which I suspect any kind of a, a speech or language um, a delay is rolling a ball back and forth because that is in essence that is the best uh, representation or symbolism or analogy for what communication is it's back and forth it's give yes. and take it's input yes. and it's output right you see so Love Laura that. and I we're doing this conversation if you will and do so you do. I do you do. Doing the dance the yes. dance is so important but when you focus on peppering your child with questions and having them learn letters, numbers, shapes, and colors. Once you say what color is it, your child says blue, then what do you do? How do you keep that conversation going? So that is why <laughs> I encourage parents to focus on the most important words because my child did not speak until he was close to five. I mean, my son is autistic. He's apraxic. I mean, my son has major sensory issues. At three, I wasn't sure my son would ever be verbal. I really didn't know if that would happen. Um, and so, uh, you know, it, it's amazing. If you follow me on social media, you know, Aaron is 16 now. Aaron is fully conversational. He is beautifully quirky and I am so okay <laughs> with that, you know. Um, and, and so anyways. And he's got um, his own power words. If you guys missed it, he informed um, Carrie that she is now old because she is 50 and is halfway to 100. So, I mean, <laughs> we'll take it, honestly. Right, that's I want to hear we'll it. it. We'll take it. Absolutely. <laughs> so like some of the most important, powerful words for very young children are words for, uh, to be able to, to call the people in their life, like mama, dada. Yep. You know, my yes. son didn't say mama till I don't even know, four or five years old. I mean, it is mm. so hard to not hear mama from oh, your, it's your, your, your child. It's so I hard. mean, it's devastating. So mama, dada, papa, nana, bubba, sissy, you know, your dog's <laughs> name, your fish's yep. name. I don't even know who's important to your child, but I promise you those are what we call powerful words. We also want your child to be able to, I mean, requesting is an important skill for a young child. If he wants his choo choo sure. or he wants crackers or he wants a cookie or he wants to go asai, asai. <laughs> That's how a lot of people say outside, right? It's so true. I'm big into teaching the sign to go with. This is the, the baby sign for outside like you're turning a doorknob um, just because again if I can't elicit the speech I can hopefully get the gesture right so that it we're starting we're working on initiation like Laura talked about earlier so other powerful words are what you know assertive words and I would argue three very important assertive words for a young child are no mine and stop it because <laughs> if you don't give children a way to manipulate their environment they will hit they will bite yeah. They will pinch, they will shove, they will tantrum scream. even scream. They will. Yeah. they will. And so no mind and stop it to me are absolutely essential words. Um, every human being, regardless of age, has a right to defend themselves and their property. So if a child at daycare goes to take their toy, you you need to make sure the child can say, No, mine, stop it. Right. Yeah. So it's Love not it. perfectly intelligible, or if the child has siblings, right? So because again, if you don't give them words, they will use 
challenging behavior, right? They will hit, bite, pinch, all of that. I just had a, a, you know, a case the other day. I have a kid who can say no, like a no comes out when he is not emotionally in distress. Like no is a very easy word for him now mm -hmm. to say. It is in fact in his motor plan. It has in fact been motor learned. So if you talk about when, like last week, we were talking about difference between motor performance and motor learning. He does have motor learning for no. However, in a heightened state of emotionality, when he is upset. So what happened was, is I was giving him choices with something and I chose the wrong one because I can't see him because I'm still doing telehealth. Mm -hmm. So I chose the wrong choice. He was losing it, losing it on the other side. So I pause it and I'm like, what's wrong? And dad is like, oh, he wanted that one. And I, so I talked, talked to the kid and I was like, hey, tell me no. It is okay right. to tell me no. And his like eyes got really big. Like, is it okay? And I'm like, yes, it if is. I did something that you didn't like, it is right. okay to tell me no. And he was happy as a clam. He's like, no. <laughs> I'm like, good. So you which one did you want? Him. You empowered yes. him, Laura. And that's what communication is all about. Yes. Is being able to defend yourself and to let other people know what it is you want, what you need, what you desire. You need to be able to protest. I mean, protesting is one of the yes. many functions of language. So it again, is. parents, I know society is indicating that your child, your young child learning letters, numbers, shapes, and colors is the most important thing. But please listen to SLPs when we say those are not the, the basis for functional communication, okay? Right. Those are the basis for testing a child, for just figuring out specific um, knowledge that has been wrote, memorized. It really isn't indicative of the ability to have a, a conversation, to communicate. So yeah. we really want to um, uh, really stick with powerful words. The other type of powerful words that I have listed on this free um, uh, infographic that I made are words like hi and bye. When you go to the grocery store, you know, somebody <laughs> says hi. I mean, it's great when a child can respond so verbally. Great. Things like help, all done, uh, eat, drink, potty sad. You know, if the child's sad, that's a sign yeah. for sad, right? Yeah. So again, emotions are important too. Your child should be able to tell you when they're sick, when they have a boo-boo, when they're sad, right? All of those are very important. So I, I just want to make sure that we're focusing on functional and powerful words. And I will tell you that Ashlyn's first word was hi. And I describe this all the time because, of course, I'm going to have a proud mama moment for a minute. But uh -huh. it was her first word of a year. She mastered it at a year. And she mastered it in every intonation possible to get. And you know what? It got everyone's attention wherever she was. You're right. In the grocery store. If you pass this little one-year-old mm -hmm. that's sitting in the cart and she's like, hi. hi. <laughs> oh, yeah. They're every time. They're like, well, hi, cutie. Yeah. You know, and like talking to her and she could do it in so many ways. I mean, I remember when actually I was just telling this story for my grief presentation today. Um, when I got the apraxia diagnosis, I put her in her car seat and she went, she could, t I was totally in a fog. I wasn't even looking at her right. when I hear hi. So much communicated through that. Hi. She was oh. like, what? like, what's wrong? Hi. Oh. Oh. Yeah. 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 It's so powerful. And oh my gosh. My gosh. Yeah, I just, yeah, it's yeah. So amazing. Somebody has to get off and somebody else asked if this info was on my website and it yes. is. Well, are you going to post the infographics on? Yes. I'm so well? sorry. I'm going to post them. I no, promise. No, no. I just want people to be able to access them. So if you go to carrieebertseminars.com, you scroll That's down. That's the best place to get them because There's you're going to get the actual download. When I post, it's going to be um, like a, a screenshot of that. Yeah, download. no, you don't. Yeah, and I sent you the PDF, so you should be able to share a PDF, Laura. Oh, good. You know okay. I mean? Oh, great. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but you and guys want to actually don't click like on the photo and try to download that. I include you if you go to my website, but I'll also include it on my Facebook page when this is over. But don't click on the photo. I just put the photo in to show you what it is. You want to click on the link that will take you to the PDF so you can download and then print it if you want. So yes, whoever was asking, that was Allie, if it was posted. It absolutely is. This is something that I am doing. Um, you know, Laura and I are going to post these weekly, hopefully 
um, to kind of tie in with what our topic is. That's my goal. I don't know if I can do it. It takes me a whole day to make one of yeah, these. Yeah, I'm like, so. Carrie, you're amazing. I mean, well, honestly, you guys, what you see Carrie do actually takes a lot of work, yeah. which is why you don't see me do it. <laughs> well, <laughs> because yeah. it is a lot of time and it's a lot of Tons. work and it's amazing that you're offering it for free. And um, yeah, it's and it's only so because we're doing on court. You know, I mean, I have a ton of handouts and things available on my website. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. You know, since I'm a professional speaker, I do see a few kids still privately, you know, and do some speech therapy. Honestly, I miss it tremendously. Oh. But as a professional speaker, you know, I'm speaking multiple times a week. Now they're all yeah. webinars. But normally yeah. I'm traveling. Normally I'm in an airplane, staying at hotels. Um, haven't traveled for over a year now. So my life is like, I don't even know who I am anymore. I'm a totally different person, <laughs> but um, I had to totally rework my business plan and I don't know. So we're surviving. So that's good. But let's move on. Our next strategy is to replace test like questions with comments. Do you have any thoughts yes. on this one, Laura? I mean, I think it became very readily apparent to me when I had Ashlyn, how much children are peppered with questions. Exactly. Hi, how are you? What's your name? How old are you? What school mm -hmm. do you go to? Do you have a brother? Who's your sister? What's her name? And I'm like, mm -hmm. uh, oh, we need to back it way up here. <laughs> so here's what I love, Laura. Let's say you and I are like, I come to Denver and I'm like, hey, Laura, Laura let's go out for dinner. And you're like, okay. And we get to the restaurant and I'm sorry. And I do this. So Laura, what's your favorite color? What's your favorite restaurant? Well, what's your favorite wine? It's not a conversation. We should do it real fast. Hold on. Do it real fast and show people how unnatural this is. Start okay, over. So, so what's your favorite color? Purple. Oh, okay. Do you have any pets? Oh, uh, yeah. I have two dogs and a cat. Where'd you go to high school? Um, what kind of uh, wine do you like? No, little what kind of wine? Uh, like, uh, you know, like wine? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Have you ever I like had wine? Food? What, what Chinese restaurant do you like? To, do you like Chinese? Because I don't know. Sometimes I do. Do you like Chinese? <laughs> so I think you guys get the idea. Like, this is not a natural form of communication. This is not what people no. do. No, it's not. Okay. And so instead of, of asking, what color is it? Which is such a common question. How about if you just say, okay. Oh, and I got something to share with you guys. How about <laughs> instead of saying, what color is it? Why don't you just say, oh, the truck is red. Beep, beep right? Or the dog is Love brown. Woof, woof. So if you follow me on Facebook, I just posted this. I had posted this. This is an old um, I article. I love that one. I have a blog post on it too. Oh my I God. Do. It freaks me out because there are some kids. I'll never forget this little guy. He's actually on the cover of my Apraxia book. So I mean, he's amazing. Really? Um, That's cool. Oh, yeah. He's so cool. But I saw him after early intervention and I saw him at his uh, uh, preschool and his teacher and his parents were so concerned because he couldn't get his colors. You'd say, hey buddy, this this is a blue dog. And you'd say, what color is it? And he'd go red. You'd say, no, it's yep. a blue oh, dog. What color time. is it? Pink. This is a blue. And I was like, oh my God. And his parents and his teachers were like, why can't he learn his colors? Right? So this <laughs> is a, like a five-year-old who's getting ready to go to kindergarten and doesn't know his colors. You guys, this article, it's, it's linked it's on so my, good. I posted it again on my Facebook page. It's from 2010. There's nothing current about it, but it is fascinating to read. So exactly. when, that's why on this infographic, I actually changed it because I did, <laughs> at first it said the, the red truck. Oh, I see the red truck. No, no, no. When you teach colors, you want to, because in English, we put adjectives first, right? Mm -hmm. Big truck, red truck, yep. all of that. But the problem is the child perceives that word red to be like a, um, a proper noun like yep. Heather or Joan or, yep. or, or Stacy or whatever. So instead you say the truck is red. So the child learns that it's a concept that the truck is the noun and that we're now describing something about it. Now, like in Spanish, where does the adjective go? It, it goes, goes after. after it. Yeah. It goes, so I'm just telling you in English, we have these, this issue where we put adjectives before the noun and we are, we know now that it is harder for kids to learn concepts. So if you have a child who isn't learning their colors, I'm not talking about an 18 month old. I don't teach 18 month old <laughs> colors. It's fine to say in context, Hey buddy, do you want your red cup or your blue cup? Sure, like, I don't have sure, a problem sure, sure. with that, but I'm talking about quizzing them, you know, consistently peppering them with that question. So instead of saying, what color is it? Why don't you just tell him, oh, you found that that, that truck is red, right? Or that dog is, yeah. is brown. So anyways, check out the article on my Facebook page. Laura, you know about it. You wrote a blog post, you said? Yeah, I, I did so long ago because I remember this phenomenon of learning colors. And this is such a phenomenon, you know, 
that article is talking about learning in general and mm -hmm. kind of just like general learning of concepts mm -hmm. where apraxia is tricky because, you know, we require, when we test kids, we require that verbal response. Right. And the problem was, is like, Ashlyn would be on autopilot for a color. So it would be like, what color is this? You know, like, here's another cup of mine. What color right. is this? And she might be purple. And I'd be like, is that purple? And she'd go, no. And I'm like, so what the heck is going right, on right, here? Like, why right. is she saying this? Because mm -hmm. she knows that's not purple. Right, and so right. that's why I wrote a blog post on it because apraxia adds like another element. It does. Yes. <laughs> because one of the things Dave and I talk about in our book is that as kids with apraxia get older, so I'm talking now like elementary school age, Ashlyn is in, is she from fifth grade? Fifth, yep. Do you notice that she ever has word finding problems? All the time. And okay. so many of my kids with apraxia do. So what Dave and I actually wrote in our book is that we feel like one of the reasons kids with apraxia, as they get older and more verbal, end up having word finding problems is because the word bank in the brain, meaning that vocabulary bank, it's not well established because early on kids with apraxia have a tendency to say a word for a period of time and then they replace it with another word so they don't use that word for a while. So their vocabulary actually is very weak. And I notice with my son, again, my son has dual diagnoses of autism and apraxia, but I notice that he'll say a word, you know, in context, we teach it to him like when we're reading a book. He's really good at a compensatory strategy of asking, what does that mean? We're so glad he finally learned that. So we explain it and he seems to understand it. And then he'll use it for a couple days. And then all of a sudden, like a week later, he can't think of the word. He can't come up with it. He can't use it in context. And so I'm like, well, no wonder he struggles with reading, you know, because he and, and struggles coming up with new words because he has a really difficult time maintaining that word bank, if you will. So it is a fascinating phenomenon. Mm -hmm. That kind of goes along uh, with apraxia. Sometime I think we need to do comorbidities with apraxia. That would be a great topic for us to discuss. You know, I did a Zoom with Jordan from Fighting for My Voice because I am so actually fascinated with the word finding aspect that seems to affect so many of my clients along with my daughter. And um, it is really fascinating how he breaks down what speech therapists traditionally would refer to as word finding. And he gives his interpretation as someone with apraxia on what might also be happening. So certainly there are wow. cases of... Um, you know, of word finding, but mm -hmm. there are also cases where he's legit just having an apraxic moment. So one example might be he ordered iced coffee all the time and that's what he said. So in his motor plan, because apraxia is a disorder of motor planning, he always said iced coffee, iced coffee, iced coffee. So for, you know, 360 days last year, <laughs> he possibly said iced coffee. Well, now he decided he wanted a cold brew. Oh. And so and he goes to the drive through and he was on a live and he ordered iced coffee and one of his followers was like, I thought you wanted a cold brew. And he's like, I did. And they're like, you said iced coffee. And he was like, I did. And he, sure enough, he gets to the window and he's given a nice coffee. And he was like, oh no, that's just because it was practiced and in my motor plan. But so he would argue he knew it's in his word bank. The problem was iced coffee had been more practiced. Yeah. The whole topic is so uh, fast. We should have him on as a guest. <laughs> can we please, can we do a three-way Facebook live? Ah, I wonder if we can. We'll have to look into it, Carrie. Does anybody know? We're going to find out. If anybody knows, because I have another person that I just met on Instagram, and she's like the bomb, and she talks about executive function, and I'm yes. like, oh, my God. Like, I would love, now Tara that my son's Sumter, older. Right? Yes. How do you yeah. know? Yes. I love yes. her. I totally yeah. said to her. So if we have to do it as a recording, if we can't do this three-way like we did with Dr. Levy, we can yeah, do that. Yeah, yeah. Like, and I've got good feedback for Dr. Levy, too. You do? Good, good. So I we did. can do Jordan. We could have um, Tara Sumter on. I would love to do that because I think executive function is something that I'm – really fascinated with now and recognize my son has major issues with executive function, but I'm not sure anybody's really addressing it. You know what I mean? In the school. Agreed. So it is, it is fascinating. So, okay, let's move on to the next one. Um, talk and read books face to face with your child. Laura, why is it so important that we're face to face? You know, I know that you you have this in your infographic to make it easy for parents, but the technical term we talk about is mirror neurons. So right. if we can mirror what your face is doing to the child, um, there's just this phenomenon, and I don't know, maybe you can explain it better, but it does allow the child to imitate more easily. And we see this in babies. So, right. you know, the mother always has the baby to her face. You know, it would be very unlikely that, you know, a mother has a three-month-old, turns them outward, and 
and is like blowing raspberries at them. Right. I mean, that's Why ridiculous. They're that? not going to yeah. do that. Why would you do that? Right. You're always right. going to have them to your face. And that is an innate, um, in, in instinctual activity that a mother does with her child because we know that the mirror neurons is I see you and I can, it helps me do it. Yeah. So Dr. Eating Strand talks about visualizing movement. Okay. Since a practice yeah, is it. a movement problem, it's about visualizing movement. The only way to visualize the movement, like I think it's really cool that on this, that Laura and I are face to face. I also I see know. myself. I don't know if you guys have ever done a face. Like I see myself <laughs> down here and I try to ignore myself. And I'm fascinated watching like more it's facial expression I'm like drawn in and um <laughs> but it's that face-to-face -face interaction so let me just grab here I go again you're all <laughs> making she fun goes of me again. grabbing a book every right? time you guys she's so gonna be just, grabbing you know, a book one of my favorites for repetitive <laughs> speech practice more blueberries the word blueberries happens like 28 times something ridiculous in this book so if you're working with a child but anyways so most people when they read a book they sit like this with the child on their lap is that yeah. fair to say that's a very that's common very way to read to a say. book Yes. But when a child has difficulty planning the movements necessary for speech, when you are snuggling with your child at nighttime and the whole purpose of reading is to calm them down, to get them ready for bed, that it's really about just listening to the words, that's fine yeah. to do that. Yeah, of course. Don't ever stop that. That is for bonding. That is totally. for literacy. That is beautiful. But if you are using a book, if in the middle of the day your child brings you a favorite book, your child is wide awake, it's not time to rock them and snuggle them, this is how I want you to, let me just grab, I got to grab my absolute favorite book for this demonstration <laughs> now, okay? So let's see where it went. I and had while she's doing that, you guys, I will tell you that in my office, it's very much the same thing. Like, I will always be sitting across from the child, whether that's on the floor or whether that's at a dedicated space like a desk or whether I have them in a cube chair or something like that. And I'm always going to have the book facing them and them to be able to look at me. And that is how I'm going to read the book to them. That's right. So here's where Spot. For toddlers, I would argue this is the best book. If you want to get your child talking, there is no better book than this. I don't even read the words on the page. I do this because it's a flat book. Knock, knock, knock. <laughs> right? So every Love page it. is knock, knock, knock. So we get the motor imitation, knock, knock, knock. <gasps> Boo. So it's yeah. over and over. And so, and then my favorite page, you know, extra credit for anybody who knows who's hiding under the bed. Does anybody, Laura, do you know who's hiding <laughs> under the bed? Do you know this I book? actually don't. Oh, okay. Well, because you don't work with toddlers. So let me just tell you, it's the alligator. And so <laughs> right my finger. So here we go. Are you ready? Ow. So that's a good song, right, Laura? A complex vowel. Ow. Yeah. See the movements? Yeah. Two movements, parents. Ow. So I find it is the easiest diphthong to teach because it is an actual exclamation. It actually has meaning behind it. And so I can get, in my first visit with any apraxic kid, I have so much success with where spot. But again, it's because of how I'm positioned. It's because I'm not reading the words on the page. I'm highly repetitive, which is going to be one of our next strategies on here. Oh, no, I lost my paper. Where did it go, Laura? Oh, no, you're going to have to read it. Where did it go? It might, oh, here it is. It fell. Um, <laughs> so um, that is why reading books to your child face-to-face -face is critical. But when you have a conversation, if you look at the infographic, I found a picture of a dad kneeling down so that he's oh, at eye level, one. right, yeah. with his child. So just know that there's a reason SLPs don't have children sit on our laps, right? That's yeah, not yeah. going to be helpful, yeah. okay? Yeah. If I find some of my um, babies with Down syndrome, they love to snuggle up <laughs> on my lap. So oh, I will sit I in front of a mirror. If you have a, a, a closet mirror that hangs, you know, That's a great idea. Way, you turn it so that it's this way and you no, hang it like in the toy room or in the family room at a level where when you're sitting and the child is on your lap. So yeah. we call that indirect eye gaze so the child can still see. The whole purpose of this, you guys, is so the child can visualize your movement. So they can yeah. see, ow, or mm -hmm. whatever mm -hmm. it is. Um, so anyways, that's why that one is important. You know, she snuck in another strategy on you guys <laughs> that she doesn't have on this infographic. And this is something I tell parents to do all the time. And it is, you don't have to read the book the way oh, the book is written. That's right. That's you know, right. your, th your birth to three, even your birth to five, I mean, like, depending on their reading level, like, they can't read anyways. They're, they're picture books for a reason. Right. And it's because you're looking at the pictures. <laughs> so, you right. know, as parents, you know, and adults, you're drawn to the words because you have that experience. 
experience, but children mm -hmm. are not. Children are drawn to the pictures. And so you can absolutely adapt any book to make it, um, you know, this, I, I'm a huge fan of books and therapy. I know a lot of people um, get intimidated by it <laughs> just because they don't know how to use it, I think is really right. the thing. And, you know, honestly, right. I had a mentor who just, you know, was so what such a proponent of literacy and using books and speech therapy to promote literacy that that's mm -hmm. why I think it came naturally to me. But um, definitely you can adapt a book. So just because a book like that spot book reads a certain way, that doesn't mean you can't adapt it and do not, not like Carrie was doing for knock, knock, and then open it up and say, boo. And, and you could do a variety of things with that. Right. Some of my kids could do open, like, what should I do? What should I do? Should I Open, right. yes, right. open. Yes. You know, right. like it could be so many different things that you can well, do. Well, let's do an episode on books. I think we yeah, should. Yeah, I love it. I we should. Books therapy tools. Yes, I got to get into my storage unit and pull out all my books because I don't have them currently, but that would be so fun. Wouldn't that be fun? It would be fun because since both of us love it. <laughs> I love it. So real quickly, and I promise I'll move on, high five animals for toddlers. It's just about high fiving. And so again, it's not about talking. It's about just trying to get them to initiate a gross motor movement. That's one there of my favorites. Go. The books by Jimmy Fallon. I, I love those Mom ones. And, and Baby just came out. So I love them. Oh, Baby just, <gasps> Baby just I came out? I don't have that one. I have, Why I have do I spend my... money every time I talk to you? It I know. Is like Everybody problem. tells me that. They're like, I hate you because every time I watch your, or, you know, read your Instagram post, I like have to spend money. <laughs> you guys, I'm obsessed. If you buy anything, buy books over toys. And I'm serious yes. about that. Like there is so much power in books, highly repetitive. And then for prosody, I'm telling you right now, we know. Oh, I love that us. book for prosody. Amazing. There is only one word in the whole book. The word is yes. moo. Yes. Moo with a question mark. How do you say it, Laura? Moo? Right. How do you say moo with an exclamation point, a small exclamation point? Moo. Moo. Yeah. How about a loud, large exclamation point? Moo. moo! <laughs> right? And then my favorite page. Oh, where I missed it. It's where he goes up and down the hill. And this is the most fabulous thing. I love it. Moo. That. moo. 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 <laughs> it's awesome. And, then, and I also love the one where it's moo moo. Like, uh oh. <laughs> So it's again, a great book. I, if I have to teach prosody, give me a book. I don't. I have three books. I have, have you? Called, I wish I could pull books Dude. like you can, but oh, I have I, a book for prosody that's called Say Zoop. Have you ever heard oh, of Say Zoop? Up, 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 up. Yes. Oh, here we go. It's going to be oh, in your blue it. section. It's a blue book. <laughs> there we go. Say Zoop. That's right. I don't. How did you do that? It wasn't even in your blue section. Because my tall books. My tall books. <laughs> oh, tall. No, people always make fun of me and say, how do you know where your books are when you color code them? I'm like, dude, don't you even challenge me. Don't you. I know oh, I, I know better. I would not challenge every you. Every spine of every book I own. You guys, I'm not even kidding you. For my birthday, because it's my birthday. So anyways, I ordered, I'm not exaggerating, 30 new children's books this month. I counted them. Oh <laughs> They're all sitting gosh, out there. Karen. I haven't even put them on my shelf yet. 30 new books. Like I am so obsessed. I, I it's, it's insane. But like, if you want to teach children a skill, if you want to teach them opposites, how about hip opposites? Right. Yeah. I and mean, I have books for everything related to language and it's all in a book, right? I can do um, that so, in terms of elementary. I can, I can find a book that teaches regular past tense and uses right. regular past tense throughout the, the whole book. I can find a book that teaches carrier phrases. Like I right. hear this, oh. I hear this, I see this, I and see this. And it's repetitive. Phrases? I have, oh, no, that's we have it. It's a, and mm -hmm. we got to get through this graphic. Okay. Like, girl, okay, we're, we're going to hurry. Fine. Okay. <laughs> okay use, now this is one, Laura may not, because I work with toddlers, I put this on here, but use less language when trying to elicit speech. What I hear is a lot of times people trying to be really good language models. So saying something like, oh, say bye-bye to the cute puppy. We need to go now. Well, that's lovely, but it might be better to just model bye-bye puppy because it's yeah. something that your child can actually maybe attempt to imitate. So be a good language model, but understand that being a good language model is different from being a good speech model. Speech and language are not the same thing. Oh, so that is so powerful. It because is. Because it is, like, because we're taught a lot of times to be good language models, model right. rich language. Mm -hmm. But for a child who might be struggling with language and with speech, or speech specifically, as mm -hmm. you just alluded to, it's more like we, you have to know the goal, right? Is right. the goal to model the language, 
structure is the goal to simply like right. make the speech easier and more attainable because you know I will tell you and this could be a whole nother topic too because you and I both agree on teaching approximations and not yeah. all apraxia experts do and that's fine that's fine but I do and it's because Ashlyn was not willing to imitate Ashlyn the minute we told her to say ash in she was mm -hmm. willing to do it Right. So, right. I mean, uh, anyway. Absolutely. So, um, yes. Yeah. So let's move on. So less language. Sound again. effects is like silly. If you don't have, I wish I could pull out all my materials and be in my office because Carrie will do it for you, but she's got her silly sound cards and you guys, they really are so much fun. You know, they're not like, yeah, these cards are so great and she's got so many of them and kids actually really love them. They love them. And the reason, so I've been using a homemade version of these. I just printed off like I used a type of a program where it had photos on it's called picture this I made these years ago and have used them for children um, autistic children for children with apraxia and I've always been blown away that I can get sound effects before I you know can get words so things like pee pee and just like yeah yum, yeah, yum, yeah, yum. yeah and wee and <laughs> yeah. boom boom and yeah. uh -oh. these are great and the, they're so the great the whole point of these is you know you hold them next to your mouth right yes. so the child yep. can visualize the movement yep. these are not called flashcard no. Laura, we call these visual cues. There is yeah, a absolutely. huge difference between flashcards and visual cues. And one thing that Edie Strand says in her seminar, in, in one of her trainings, is you want to avoid games and activities that draw the child's attention away from your mouth. Right. Where do you want the child's attention? Yeah, always right on your mouth. Here. Yeah, yeah. I mean, this size so that you can yeah. stick them next to your face and everything you yeah, do. Yeah, they're beautiful. So the great thing about sound effects is you can embed them into into playtime, right? You can embed them into story time. You can exclamations like, uh oh, wee, oh no. Yeah. Those are easily embedded just into daily interactions. So I'm a big believer. You have a beep, can... beep one. And I, I can specifically remember reading Little Blue Truck with a kid uh -huh. and then holding up her beep, beep card every time Little Blue Truck says beep, beep. So again, we're incorporating literacy with the book. We're incorporating the Thank visual you. cue with Carrie's mm -hmm. sound cards. And the focus is now back to your face because it was on the book. But now right. we're back up here at the face. And it's repetitive and um, it's effective. Yeah, yeah. One of the ones since Easter is coming up. Um, let me, I'm <laughs> sorry. So this is my, oh my gosh. I don't know where I put it now. Shoot. But I have that what? one. What? It's uh, not possible. It, well, I just took a picture of it. I don't know. It's not my, oh, I see it, but it's too far away. So it's called Hop Hop. And it's a Leslie Patricelli book where every, you know, it's just repetitive. Hop Hop. Oh, I love hop, her. Hop Hop. Hop Hop. Oh, we got to do a thing on Over books. and over. So I have. Oh my God. Like, How do I not have this book? Oh, great. Yeah. Add to cart. Thanks, Carrie. Now I got to see. Is this it? Now I just have to find it. Is this it? That's not it. Where is it? And now I'm like, I'm, I'm irritated that I don't have While it While right she's here. doing that, you know, our next one is, um, we'll avoid telling your child to say words. I mean, honestly, Carrie has a whole seminar on don't say, say. <laughs> I will tell you that when they are coming to me, it's not as a scary word anymore to say, say. So I do get a lot of questions that are like, oh, I saw you doing therapy and you told the child to say, say, and Carrie Ebert says you absolutely don't ever say, say. And I'm like, like Carrie Ebert works with birth to three and she's right, correct right. with that population the best way to shut a child down under three is to tell them say this and they're like right. mm, I'm I don't got to do what you say mm -hmm. <laughs> like mm -hmm. but by the time they get older and they're used right. to school and they're used to things this you can tell them to say yeah. this and instead of saying say you can say things like you try Yep, you turn, try, you do. Tell mm -hmm. me, I yep. just don't ever like the word say because what here's, and let me just tell you what my rationale is. Let's say I say, say ball and the child says ball. Let's say it worked. Sure, so okay. everybody says it's fine. Well, what I'm going to argue is we're creating prompt dependency because that's now true the child will only say yeah, the word that's true when he's told to say it. That's Let's say true. the child is autistic and has echolalia and I say, say ball. What does the autistic child say? <laughs> say ball, right? Say because ball. Yeah, word. Okay. Exactly. What if I say say ball and the child is apraxic, has a praxy of speech and can't say it? Then what happened is I just set him up for failure. So yeah. what I would rather do is give you a way where I'm going to model it for you. We're going to sit face to face. We're going to say it in unison, which is one of our next strategies. Um, and I'm going to give you multi-sensory cueing to find a way to help you be successful. But what I refuse to do is to set you up for failure intentionally. I will not do that is, 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 is create a moment. And some people, parents often will say, oh, he's just stubborn. No, he can't say no, that no, word. No, no, no. Just, no, no, no. Apraxia is not I won't. Apraxia is I. I can't. So just yeah. because a child said a word three minutes ago does not mean he can no. motor plan and say mm -hmm. it again. So no. we don't use um, any kind of behavior management. We don't withhold no. from a child until they say a word. That is not 
even close to being appropriate for the, the therapy that we do for these kiddos. So what do we have next? Um, choose books and songs with repetitive words. Why this is this is honestly my favorite one. Yeah. You know, it reduces the cognitive load. And so that's the big thing. When a child is engaged in a storybook, so many things can be going on, including comprehension, vocabulary, and things like that. When we choose repetitive books or books that we have read over and over and over and over and over and over, the language, um, the language is reduced, the, the language demands are reduced reduced because they already know what's coming and mm -hmm. when they already know what's coming you can use the pause technique is where you stop before a target word or elicited word that you might want them to pop out with and they already know it because in their head they're going along with it right. so um yeah i went walking is a i went one. walking what did you so see all this multi-sensory feeling going yeah i give them the first sound I, I i do this because it's by my eye what do yep. you see and then I'm yeah. just going to pause and look at the child expectantly. This is what I coach parents on. So when you're yeah. reading this book, every page has the same exact, um, you know, ending phrase, if you will. Yeah. So it's really powerful. Okay. Um, focus on, okay. This is one I just added uh, earlier today. And I, I actually agree this. with it though. Do you, are you, talk, talk to us about why we want to choose fewer target words um, at home. Well, for one, the research supports, even in therapy, with principles of motor learning, we want to have less targets to maximize the amount of repetitions that we get with the child. So, so starting off right there, it's based on research. Now, I will just tell you from the parent perspective, um, you're already being their mom, <laughs> and you have a lot going on to teach them. And so if you can just give parents five target words, and we're talking functional, and we're talking powerful, like we Carrie's already gone through. Words. Right, Laura, high frequency, high frequency yeah. words. Yeah, and just like you already talked about too, that they have to be powerful too. They have to be those power words. And if you can give parents those that are high frequency, you know, some of my favorites are like out because mm -hmm. we take our kid out of the high chair, out of the car seat, out mm -hmm. of the bathtub, outside. out of the crib, outside. Like mm -hmm. we can get out all the time. We can get mm -hmm. high all the time. Maybe mama, maybe dada, but give parents something to focus on. And with principles of motor learning, you have acquisition of a target. And that's what you want to give parents the, the words to practice is you've been able to get acquisition in the therapy session and then principles of motor learning tell us that distributed practice which is practice that occurs kind of throughout their day in natural context promotes generalization or if you caught us last week pr motor uh, promotes learning. motor mm -hmm. learning exactly mm -hmm. and so I am I, I and I will have to be full disclosure honest people were shocked when I did a blog post with other two apraxia moms when Ashton was young and we all said we don't sit down and do homework we don't like, I can't do it. I can't do nope. it. I cannot fight with a three-year-old no. and make her go through flashcards and make her go through target words. And uh, we have sticker charts and, and it's emotionally no. distraught for her no. and for me. It's a mess. It's traumatic, I mean, I do it. you guys. It's traumatic it's for traumatic. everybody. Homework is not appropriate for very young children. Here's what we call it in early intervention. Are you ready? It's called embedded intervention. I'm <laughs> going to put you a strategy that you yeah. embed into a routine you already yes. naturally do. Yes. So you embed yes. a strategy. Here's your strategies, parents. Yes, yes. Please, it's, it's not homework time. for 30 minutes it's and we drill not. some words. If, if, if parents, however many parents are on here, if... if you need to not feel guilty like, oh, I didn't sit down and work on speech for 30 minutes. I don't ever want and I did. you to sit down ever no. under any no. circumstance. Do I want you to sit down? I want you, I want to give you, I call it target word therapy, right? I want you yes. to go home with five, four, three, four, five target words. So maybe it's her brother's name, Ashlyn's brother's yeah. name. Yep. Maybe it's Ashlyn's dog's name. Maybe yes. it's pizza because that's her favorite food. Yeah. Maybe it's um, Elsa because she loves Frozen. Do you see what I'm getting exactly. at? It's going to be these high frequency words. So I, I just got to tell you real quick. I had a little friend and I asked his mom, what five words do you wish Micah could say? And she said, I don't need five words. I just need one. I was like, well, what one word do you want Micah to say? She's like, Spider-Man. And I was like, oh, crap. <laughs> Like I was not like expecting like this three syllable word with a consonant with an S at the beginning. Yeah, I was like, oh my god. So I was like, why Spider Man? She's like, the dude loves Spider Man. He yeah. has Spider Spider Man fruit snacks. He has Spider Man shoes. He wants to read a Spider Man book. He wants to watch a Spider Man show. You know, all of these things. So she's like, I all he does is scream, and I have to go. Do you want this? Do you want this? Do you want this? So our best approximation of Spider Man that we got was Bob Man. Bob Man. Right? Yeah, so that's great. But we got bye, man. And because he says it 14,000 times a day, <laughs> bye, man, bye, man, bye, man. And he would sign with it. So he'd go, bye, man, which meant bye, man, book. 
Bye, man, book. Bye, man. Yeah. Bye, yeah. man, do. That is Bye, adorable. Man, do. So, Spider Man chew. So, Bye, man, eat with Spider Man oh. fruit snacks, right? Yeah. So, then Bye, man became Bada Man. Bada Man. Bada Man. Bada Man. Yeah, Bada-man. and you get it R-man refined. Man, all on its own because he does not have an articulation disorder. He has a praxis of speech. Bye, man. Bye, man. So, I told mom after like six months of him saying Bye, man, we need to get the S on the front. Spider Man. Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Yeah. So I use a string with a knot on the end. Great for teaching S blends. Spider-Man, Spider-Man, Spider-Man. Because you know, I will say that though, word. I don't want parents to like go in and, and decide what, like when you developed that, you know, mm-hmm. the um, developmental uh, phonological processes right, right, that right. are appropriate. So right. I, I just give the caveat because this was to be to parents that ask your SLP right. and ask the yeah. SLP what they think the best approximation yes. for a difficult word like Spider-Man would be. Is. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Cause I yeah. just had Trick a mom treat. too. Yeah. Somebody said trick or treat. Yeah. T O T. The key is always keep the same number of syllables. Do not reduce syllableness. Oh yes. Agreed. You yeah. really want to keep sy- syllableness, if that's even a word, intact. So trick or treat is not t t, it's t o t. Yeah, agreed. O t, right? Yeah. So, okay, Laura, our very last one. Say target words together in unison. Why is this important? What is this well, based for- on? <laughs> I mean, for one, this is just, you know, um, if uh, people ask me a lot about DTTC and what is DTTC and um, DTTC incorporates what is called simultaneous production. And so simultaneous production is serving so many purposes. I mean, for one, they're looking at our face because we're both doing it together and you're getting those mirror neurons firing. You're looking at the movement of the lips and the articulators and um, it makes it easier on the child um, in terms of, you know, providing a cue for the brain to pro plan and program the movements. So sure. what would you add? Yeah, just that. Yeah, absolutely. That's what it is. It's based on dynamic temporal and tactile cueing, which yeah. is Dr. Edith Strand's approach. And even with my minimally verbal kiddos where I can't use DTTC to its fullest because the child does not yet attempt sure. verbal imitation, I am still really going to focus on if the word, the target word is mama, you know, and I use Jimmy Fallon's mama book wherever I put that. <laughs> oh I also have a puzzle that has here. mama and baby. So mama, mama, we get oh, tons of repetition. And so we will, I will say that in unison with them over and over. And then what I can do is start backing out on my uh, simultaneous productions. And it's just beautiful to watch it happen. Um, yeah. Somebody asked a question. I know we need to wrap up then is what hop hop book. I finally found it. So yes. let's yes, I need this I in can my grab life. I have like 10 of her books, but the best thing about Leslie's books, I talk about her as if I know her. I don't know who Leslie is, but she's a wonderful uh, (laughs) children's author. Maybe we can get her on, heck. (laughs) Oh my God, Lord, now I'm obsessed. We have to, okay? But it's so repetitive because over and over, she has a book called Yummy Yucky. That's one of my favorites. Make you laugh out loud as an adult. Like sandwiches <laughs> are yummy. Sand is yucky. You know what I mean? It's just so funny. So and I modify yummy. that. I modify that to sandwiches are mmm. And you know, sand is Ooh. Ooh. Yeah, oh, I it. love it. I yeah. <laughs> love it. I love it. So anyways, whoever asked, this is the hop hop book. And so it is, you know, basically an Easter book, but it's by Leslie Patricelli. So you really Perfect. want her books are all like what, six bucks, seven bucks. I mean, they're mm-hmm. highly worth it. And especially if you have a kiddo uh, who is um, needing some uh, repetitive speech practice. So in anyway, that yummy yucky book, I just have to tell you this real quick. Cause it cracks me up. If you guys know the yummy yucky book, maybe Carrie can pull it out. Cause she's the queen at knowing where her books are. Turn to the last page where they show everything that is right? yummy. So I'm showing this to a child and I'm asking him, I want him to use a carrier phrase. What does he think is yummy? You know, like I pick anyways, if you can see that peach right there, he looked at his dad and asked him why I was showing him a butt. <laughs> How funny is that? That does oh look like a gosh. I would agree. I can't read this book now without <laughs> thinking of my little guy that's like, why? <laughs> I mean, but just like, I just have to show you, like, spaghetti is yummy. Mmm. Mm. Worms are yucky. Ew. 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 Right? To get yeah. that back down. So, yep. again, just amazing books. Uh, and I post probably about every other day on books. I yeah, like Carrie's literally, amazing. Mm, I really have an issue. Um, and if you were like, hey, Carrie, here's $50 to spend, 
like some people go buy a pair of shoes. I'd be like, oh my gosh, that's like 10 fucking <laughs> books. Like I am, I don't know. I have a real issue. So anyways, <laughs> I know that Laura and I need to wrap up. We could talk for hours and hours and hours. I've had several people I see Laura talking about, ooh, executive function would be interesting. Next week, we're going to talk about what speech therapy should look yeah. like. Um, for the SLP, what strategy specifically yeah. we'll talk about feedback and we'll talk about, you know, um, you know, repetition and carryover. So we'll definitely um, talk about that next week and then we will, um, we'll figure out where we're going. So thank you yeah, guys for so joining us. <laughs> we do. Thanks for joining us and uh, hope you have a great week. Okay. We'll see okay, you. Okay. I need a you cheers. Missy, you better oh. take another cheers with me. Cheers. Here we go. Cheers. cheers. Bye guys. Thanks. Bye guys.